discussion session tonight. Good stuff, good things. Um, things that we've talked about so far uh, with fiveable natural selection, right? So the big takeaway, the big thing to remember with natural selection is that the environment is putting um, pressure on species. And because of that environmental pressure, some traits are more beneficial than others. The ones that are beneficial we call adaptations, and those therefore become more prevalent within the population just because those organisms are surviving and reproducing better than the rest. Um, a couple reminders with that, really important things, um, are that it's not a choice. And any adaptation or any advantage that an organism has um, would have already been in, would have already been present in the starting prep, starting population uh, before before the the natural selection took place. So no random things are arising just because it's necessary in the environment. Those phenotypes would have existed already. Okay, microevolution, we went into more details with that, talking about gene flow, gene regulation, genetic drift. Um, and all sorts of movements of alleles within populations and their gene pools. And then lastly, as I said last week, we talked about Hardy Weinberg, did a bunch of math with um, dominant and recessive alleles and being able to mathematically prove that evolution is occurring. So all three of those have to do with allele frequencies and gene frequencies within populations and how those change. Okay, what we're gonna be talking about, macroevolution, and I have this graphic, um, to help depict that. Macroevolution is large scale. So macro, that, that prefix means large, micro means small, like microscope, okay? Um, and so we're gonna be looking at more large scale evolution. So we're not gonna be looking at, as you can see on the left-hand side, like how a population changes to adapt to an environment. But in this case, we're looking at truly how new species form, um, which is crazy because we have, if you think about it, so many species on Earth that are incredibly diverse. We have 300,000 species of beetles on our planet. Just beetles, 300,000, right? So we have a lot of species. Um, we're going to talk about why and how those come to be. That's macroevolution, okay? That thing that you're looking at on the right-hand side, you may have talked about in class, maybe you haven't gotten there yet, that's called a cladogram. And a cladogram is going to be a representation of how things are related. Okay, so just we're going to look at them in a little bit, but the ones that are closer to one another, so like the orange and red dinosaur, the green and light blue dinosaur, the uh, blue bird and the purple dinosaur, those are going to be our most closely related species. What that means is they had a common ancestor in the more recent past than other organisms did. So when we're talking about macroevolution, we're talking about how um, all species had a, a common ancestor at one point, um, but the more recent you have a common ancestor with a different species, the closer related you are to that species. So a really common misconception that people think is that humans evolved from monkeys. That's not true. If we evolved from monkeys, monkeys would, one, no longer be here because they would have all evolved into humans, which is not true, okay? And two, it's just bad science. So we did not evolve from monkeys, but we have a very recent common ancestors with monkeys, and we diverged our separate ways into our separate species from that common ancestor, which is why we share so many traits um, and so many genes, like 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees. Um, so lots of shared characteristics. And that's, again, what we're talking about when we're talking about macroevolution. All right. Really important thing to get down is if we're talking about speciation, which we are, because that's what macroevolution is, we need to be talking about what the heck a species is. And in typical science fashion, we actually have a number of different ways that we can, if you, sorry, if you hear something, it's my dog, she's nuts. Um, we have a number of different ways that we can um, identify or name what a species is, okay? So there's four major ways that we identify what species are, meaning like that we have ways that we can differentiate what would be the same species and what would be different species. But the one that's most commonly accepted is the one that's on the slide right in front of you right now, which is the biological species concept, okay? So this defines two different species or two of the same species based on whether or not they can produce viable fertile offspring. And I'll explain that in a second. So if you are the same species as another organism, then you guys can mate and you can produce 
uh, offspring that are viable, which means living, okay, like capable of life, and fertile, which means capable of reproduction. That's what your offspring would be. They would be alive and they would be able to have babies, okay? If you can get with another organism and make babies that are living and capable of reproduction, then you are the same species as that organism. That is what the biological species concept says, okay? What that means is if organ two organisms get together or try to get together and they're incapable of producing organisms that are alive and capable of reproduction, then they are not the same species, okay? So this is truly how we define what is and what is not a species based on whether or not they can get together and make babies that are living and fertile, okay? Um, and well, I'm going to give you like a ton of examples of that in just a second, so stay tuned, okay? Um, something also that's really, really important with this species concept is that gene flow between populations um, is going to hold the phenotype of that population together. So basically what I mean by that is in order for speciation to occur, you really need to stop gene flow between the two populations, okay? Remember, populations are the same species living in the same area. So if those populations break off and go into two different areas, and that happens, right? We talked a little bit about that with like founders of fact when we talked about microevolution. If that happens, in order for speciation to occur, we need to make sure that genes are not flowing between those two populations anymore. Otherwise, they'll go by, right back to ground zero and become a mixed grouping of species of the same species again. Okay, that will make more sense when I give you some examples of speciation, um, specifically allopatric and sympatric speciation. But just know that we're going to need to stop gene flow between two populations in order for species speciation to occur. All right. In order to stop that gene flow, usually what happens is that these two populations become reproductively isolated. So that just means that they are not capable of reproducing with one another for whatever reason. And we'll talk about lots of examples in just a second about how um, two different populations can become reproductively isolated. Basically, it's just some sort of barrier. Sometimes it's a physical barrier, sometimes not, that prevents two species from mating, okay? which again is going to then prevent gene flow between those populations. Okay? Um, and if they are capable of mating, which usually they are not, then we would say that their offspring is a hybrid. Okay, so the reason I have both of these vocab words for you on this slide is because I'm going to use them um, when we look at this next slide and we look at some pre- and post-zygotic barriers. Okay, so again, all of these things that I'm about to talk about are ways that we can isolate populations from one another uh, so that they can't reproduce. Okay, so if we can do that, then we can stop gene flow or then gene flow will stop. We're not doing anything here, but gene flow will stop um, and speciation is more likely to occur, okay? All right, so here are all of the different ways that species can become reproductively isolated. This is actually a figure from a Campbell textbook. So if you use Campbell, then you have this. I think it's in chapter 25 of your textbook. You can check it out. Um, but on the left-hand side, everything that you see connected with a blue and a yellow arrow, those we call pre-zygotic barriers. And everything on the right-hand side, we call post-zygotic barriers. Okay, so in order to understand what pre- and post-zygotic barriers are, we need to know what a zygote is. So a zygote is just a fancy, fancy term for a fertilized egg. Okay, so egg and sperm come together, they form a zygote. Zygote is going to eventually develop into offspring, okay? So on the left-hand side, when I said those blue arrows are pointing towards prezygotic barriers, prezygotic means it comes before the zygote, right? So all of these barriers exist before any type of uh, egg and sperm can come together, any type of mating can occur, okay? On the right-hand side where you see the green arrows, those are post-zygotic barriers, okay? So those are barriers that actually exist between species once mating has occurred. So those species are fully capable of mating with one another, um, but something's happening to their offspring afterwards that's preventing them from either being viable or fertile. Okay? All right. I have a better breakdown here for you. So these are our prezygotic barriers. Okay? On the all the way left-hand side, I don't know where my text went. Shoot. Um, on the all the way left-hand side, 
we have something called habitat isolation. Habitat isolation. Okay, so what that means is that those species live in a different habitat and therefore they cannot mate. Okay, so what you're looking at here are two different types of snakes. We have a terrestrial or a sand snake, and we also have a water snake. Now, they're relatively similar. They probably had a recent common ancestor, so they might be capable of reproduction if we forced them to be like in captivity. But because one lives on sand and one lives in the water, they're never going to mate, right? Their habitats have isolated themselves so that they are never capable of mating. And therefore, um, they, are, they are more set um, to become separate species, right? Or continue to be separate species, I should say. I am going to really quickly, just so that you guys can see the text here, update this slide. Give me a second. There we go. That's better. This has all the titles on it. I don't know what happened to my first one. Okay, so that should be much easier to see. And I'm going to update our second slide while I'm at it so that you guys can see what the heck I'm talking about. All right, so um, as I said, these are prezygotic barriers. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Updating the second slide. Perfect. Get pumped. Postzygotic barriers coming up in just a second. Okay, we're back. My computer loads. There we go. Okay, so habitat isolation all the way on the left. Then we have something called temporal isolation. So this is another prezygotic barrier. It happens um, before the zygote forms, before these two species can make any egg or sperm, okay? So where habitat isolation was that they lived in a different area, you can think of that as like a long distance relationship, no babies being made, they live in different places, okay? Temporal isolation is all about timing, okay? So in this example, you see two skunks that actually mate during different seasons. One skunk's gonna mate during the fall and one skunk's going to mate during the spring. Uh, which is going to keep their gene pools apart. It's going to prevent gene flow between them um, because they're just not mating at the same time, okay? Um, so this is like if you tell someone, oh, the timing's just not right. That's what these skunks are saying. The timing's just not right um, because we're mating at different seasons, okay? Next one is a personal favorite. This is called behavioral isolation, okay? And this all has to do with like courtship rituals. Usually we see courtship rituals in birds and humans. But birds, like they have a special song or they have a special dance that they do for mating, okay? And each species is going to have a separate song or dance that is going to attract their specific mates. So there's a ton of videos on this. If you're not sure, if you don't believe me, um, you can check them out of different mating calls and mating dances and how that actually helps um, just birds of the same species mating with one another as opposed to with birds of a different species, okay? So those three all happen before these organisms can even attempt to mate. So they either live in a different habitat, they mate at a different time, or they have a different mating ritual, different behaviors, okay? These next two are still going to happen before egg and sperm actually come together, but um, they, these two organisms would attempt to mate, okay? So the two snails that you see, it's labeled F, says mechanical isolation, those mechanical isolation basically in in layman's terms just means the parts don't fit right so these two animals cannot mate because their their sexual reproduction organs do not fit together so in this specific instance these two snails actually have shells that go in opposite directions you'll see one goes clockwise and one goes counterclockwise and because of that they can't match up in order to mate so they won't form a zygote Okay, right? and then that last one, gametic isolation, just means that the egg and sperm aren't capable of fusion together, okay? That's actually a really challenging thing for egg and sperm to come together and fuse. So if egg and sperm do get in proximity of one another, they won't fuse together, okay? So all of those are prezygotic barriers. They happen before egg and sperm fuse. They happen before a zygote is formed, okay? So on this next slide, we're gonna talk about post and post-zygotic barriers obviously happen after the zygote, after the egg and sperm come together, okay? So, 
Um, as you can see on this slide, they're they're a little bit less common, and we can can you can kind of think about why they might be less common. Um, and I always like to try to tell my students um, to tie things back to the why. So post-psychotic barriers, these are going to be things that exist um, to prevent offspring from being either viable, living, or fertile, right? But these two organisms went through the whole process of mating and creating an offspring, which is incredibly energy consuming, right? It uses a lot of energy to create and grow a child or an offspring. Um, so because of that, uh, more often than not, there's going to be a barrier in place before all of that energy is spent, right? That's just good evolutionary practice um, that, that that's going to be the case, okay? So these are going to be less common, um, but still, if two organisms are capable of mating and producing a zygote, if they're not the same species, right? That means that they can't produce viable and fertile offspring. So something's going to happen to that offspring. There's three possible op options. One is reduced hybrid viability. So the hybrids, right, the combination of uh, the two different species parents just don't live very long, okay? So they're, they're weak, they're sickly, they don't make it very long. Sometimes they'll make it a few days, a few weeks, but they're not going to be um, sustainable and they're not going to be able to live um, as nearly, nearly, nearly as long as uh, offspring where two of the same species are meeting, okay? In the middle there, we have reduced hybrid fertility. This is one of my other favorites, okay? So if you guys have heard of mules, mules are a mixture of a horse and a donkey. Horses and donkeys are different species, okay? But mules, so you're like, well, well how, how can they be different species if they can come together and mate? Well, mules are sterile. Mules are not capable of reproducing. Okay, so when you mix the donkey and the horse, different species, to produce this offspring, the offspring that you produce is incapable of reproduction. They are infertile. Okay, um, so still following that biological species concept. Last one is hybrid breakdown. Um, so this sometimes happens. So in the picture, it's a group of grasses uh, where at first the offspring actually look to be okay. They look to be normal and relatively healthy, uh, but over time they'll start to, if they keep reproducing, their offspring will get weaker and weaker, start to die off, and, and eventually we won't see them anymore. Um, Alan, that's a great point. Sorry, I was just reading your question. That to be able to reproduce is required for any life. That's that's a really, really great point. Um, so you need to be able to survive in order to be considered alive. Um, you actually don't need to be able to produce, reproduce. So what Darwin would say is that mules are just like a waste of, of space because he judges everything, everyone's fitness based on survival and reproduction, right? So this mule is incredibly unfit because they can't pass on their genes, right? So the reason mules exist is not a natural thing. This is artificial selection. It's humans, right? Mules are incredibly strong um, and incredibly stubborn, kind of like a donkey. Um, but they're this like perfect blend of horse and donkey that makes them really, really strong and really good workers on farms. So farmers keep breeding them um, by breeding horses and donkeys together. Um, so it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be an artificial selection situation. Um, like mules shouldn't exist really in nature. Just humans, you know, we get in there and, and do our own thing and kind of mess up stuff. So great question. Glad you asked it. All right. So I'm going to re go back to our goal here of preventing gene flow, okay? Um, because all of those barriers that I just talked about and the different types of speciations that I'll mention in a second have this same singular goal of preventing gene flow uh, between populations, and that's how we get these different species. Because if you think about it, right, and I can use this picture as an example, this is a really, really great example of speciation, specifically sympatric speciation, okay, where flies are basically trained um, or yeah, trained on two different mediums, two different foods that they're eating. Uh, one group of flies is eating maltose and the other is eating starch, so different carbohydrate sources. Okay, And um, scientists actually keep them in captivity with their separate food sources. And after several generations, they bring them back together and they won't mate anymore, Okay, which is pretty crazy, um, just based off of, of the food source. So it must be some sort of smell or something that the, the flies are emanating based on their food source that's keeping um, keeping the maltose eating flies with the maltose eating flies and the starch eating flies with the starch eating flies. Um, so 
the big thing that happened there is that there was some sort of like probably chemical reaction that's keeping the same species together and um, and some separated, okay? Um, but when we talk about allopatric and sympatric speciation in a second, I want you to think about how they're preventing gene flow amongst populations. Right, because if you think about it, so if you look at the left-hand side, when we just first divided these flies into our starch medium and our maltose medium, they're still the same species there, right? If we put them back together right now, they would be capable of surviving and reproducing, okay? So it actually takes some time having them with separate environments or separate gene pools where they're just able to survive and reproduce on their two separate areas um, before we can bring them back and actually have them not be able to reproduce. Okay. Otherwise, they're just going to go right back to ground zero, and we would basically be sitting with our initial sample of fruit flies. Um, but the second you have, you know, different adaptations over here and different adaptations over here, and they come back and they reproduce, you're going to see that mixing of traits again. Okay? So, got to stop that gene flow. Got to stop that reproduction, hence the reproductive isolation. Okay. Okay. So those barriers <laughs> exist between species, right? When two things are considered different species, we have all of these different barriers that are making sure that things don't reproduce, okay? But when we are working towards speciation, there are two major types of ways in which we can get new species. Um, and those two words are allopatric and sympatric speciation. Okay, so allopatric means away, okay? Away, allopatric. So these two groups uh, of populations are going to be separated, right? A population forms a new species um, while they're geographically isolated from a parent population. So on the left-hand side, you see this fish, uh, this fish pond, I suppose, uh, has some sort of barrier in between it. I'm gonna show you another example of that in a second. And because of that, uh, the fish on the left and the fish on the right are able to evolve separately in their own environments with their own environmental pressures and perhaps their own food sources, etc. And because they're not interbreeding at all, the next time that we they would see each other, they would be incapable of reproducing and successfully separate species. On the right hand side, we have sympatric, and you can think sympatric same speciation, where we have a subset of a population forming new species without geographic separation. Okay, so there these fish are still able to mingle with each other, okay, but somehow, some way, and this is going to be more challenging if you think about it because they're all bumping into each other. It's like bumping into an X, right? Um, somehow, some way, we have to isolate these guys reproductively and cut off the gene flow between the two populations in order to successfully get two new species out of a group that's just chilling together. Right. So I'll tell you a couple different ways that we can actually prevent gene flow or stop gene flow uh, in sympatric populations. Okay. All right. So this is more of the same. It's two different examples for allopatric and sympatric speciation. Oh, yeah. Habitat isolation is a perfect example of one way in which we can we can prevent gene flow and sympatric speciation. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Great, great point, Sue. Um, so Alpatrick on the left, you see a river has formed uh, between this forest, and therefore we have two groupings of trees that are not near one another, so their pollen probably cannot spread. Uh, remember that pollen is just plant sperm, so if you're allergic to plants, you're just allergic to their sperm. Um, and if the sperm is not capable of really fertilizing the plants nearby, we might see speciation that way. On the right hand side, those guys have actually stayed in uh, the same general area, but we see that new species of trees creeping up in the middle. Uh, and again, in a little bit, I'll tell you about different ways that we can divide up the population um, that would allow for that to occur. Okay. Real life example of allopatric speciation. I believe I have two on here for you. Hopefully, I might just have this one actually. Um, but the Isthmus of Panama, you may have heard of, it's a divider uh, that arose about 3.5 million years ago between North and South America. Okay? It's a connection between the two. And we have these two pork fish, the, Pan the Panamic pork fish, and just the pork fish, pork fish, who knew there was such a thing, that live on either side of that. Okay, So again, they probably had a, a recent common ancestor. At one point, they were the same species. But when that isthmus, which was basically just a stretch of land that divided uh, the Caribbean Sea, came and formed, 
those two groups separated themselves uh, reproductively and went on to evolve separately their separate ways. So you can look at these fish and kind of see the similarities in the head and the stripes, um, but there's some sort of benefit to the panamic pork fish being kind of a brighter green. Perhaps the environment that they're living in has a lot more um, greenery or something along those lines, whereas the pork fish has a bunch of different colors. Perhaps they're mimicking another species in their side of the sea um, so that enemies don't, don't eat them. Uh, could be any number of reasons, but there's definitely rationale behind why these guys have evolved to look a little bit different over the years. Okay. All right, Sympatric, a really, really common example of Sympatric speciation, and this is going to be, Sue, another example of habitat isolation, is with um, apple maggot flies, which just sounds really appetizing, okay? And basically, what happened uh, with these with these apple maggot flies is exactly what Sue just said. They're adapting to different ecological niches. So what is a niche? So a niche is going to be um, a location or kind of a, a a, an organism's role in its ecosystem, right? So what it eats, where it lives, who eats it, all of those things, like its role in the food web, um, if it's a pollinator, like all of those things that would contribute or have effects on its ecosystem, um, that's going to be its niche. So basically, in this case, these apple maggot flies, we have new trees brought in. So we have apple trees and then hawthorn trees brought in, I believe by European settlers and planted. Um, and they have different fruits. So hawthorns are going to have a more bitter apple taste, more like a crab apple, um, as opposed to just the regular apple that you see um, in the middle on the top there. And these different flies, just they, these flies in this population just adapted to one or the other fruit. Um, and then gene flow was reduced between them because the, the apple maggot flies that produced, preferred the apples were only on apple trees. And the apple maggot flies that preferred the hawthorns were on the hawthorn trees, and then they're just not mating with one another, right? Flies don't have a very big ecosystem. They're pretty much just gonna chill in the tree that they're eating from. So they're kind of, their circle of friends are the ones that also enjoy apples or also enjoy hawthorns. Uh, and therefore, even though that's still the same population, right? That's still the same area, still the same location, they are picking different habitats or different niches within that population or that ecosystem. Um, and therefore, that's what's preventing gene flow there. Okay, so that's a big way that we can see that occurring. All right, so back to, I wanna talk about the three different ways, the three major ways um, that we can decrease gene flow and sympatric speciation. Okay, so habitat differentiation is what I just talked about. They're picking different habitats um, within the same general area, okay? So whether it's picking different, different apples to eat, um, in a minute I'm going to show you an example with lizards, um, and they are occupying different parts of a tree, so that we have like canopy lizards all the way up at the top, versus lizards that are living on, on like twig-like branches, versus lizards that prefer the trunk and ground. There's a really, really good HHMI bioinformatic uh, about that that I can certainly send along to you guys if you're interested. Um, it's really, really helpful for habitat differentiation. That is definitely one way, right? If they're occupying a different location within one general area, then they're not going to bump into each other and they're not going to have that gene flow. So that's one good way to decrease gene flow. Another major way to decrease gene flow within one single area, because again, that's what sympatric speciation is, is sexual selection. Um, so this is where females choose males based on their appearance, okay? The females are the choosy ones. So um, like if you think about it, our male species in, in the world are usually much more glamorous than the female species, right? Like cardinals, only the male cardinals are the red ones, the brilliant red ones that we see. Um, females are kind of like a brownish color. Um, and that's because they're trying to attract a mate. Same with peacocks. That's the male peacocks that have the beautiful tails. Female peacocks are like brown without a very long tail. Lions, if you think about their mane, all of those are sexual selection preferences. So if you're living, if organisms are living in the same environment and some just prefer um, one sort of species over another, that would be a good example of sexual selection. And then the last one's gonna be polyploidy. And I have a diagram to show you with this one. This is kind of a funky one. It's common um, in plants, but basically it's going to be um, because of an error in os um, osmosis, not osmosis, meiosis, that's going to lead to different chromosomes. 
All right, so habitat differentiation. Here's that example I was telling you about with the lizards. And again, I can um, I can shoot along that HHMI bio uh, HHMI biointeractive really quick. It's really really awesome. I'm gonna copy it and put it in the chat box now. Feel free to check it out in your free time, okay? Especially if you're not real sure about speciation. Um, but you can see all the way at the top, we have these really, really, really big lizards that are living up on the, the crown of the tree versus uh, lizards that are much smaller living on the trunk and the twigs um, and then in the grass and the bushes. So they have evolved separately because they're evolving to a certain location in these massive, massive trees uh, all throughout like Puerto Rico and Jamaica and Cuba um, and all sorts of islands down there. Questions about habitat differentiation. Everyone feeling okay? It's relatively straightforward. It's gonna be a little different than habitat isolation where organisms are just like forcibly in different areas like I was talking about with the water snake and the um, ground snake. This is more they're living in the same area. Um, they're just occupying different parts of it or different niches, okay? All right, <laughs> this is my really oversimplified example of sexual selection. We got dinosaurs and the blue dinosaurs are preferring to mate with the blue dinosaurs and the green dinosaurs are preferring to mate with the green dinosaurs. And therefore over time, if their gene flow kind of stops between them, if all blue dinosaurs are keeping their genes within the blue dinosaurs and greens within the greens, you can actually see sympatric speciation occur and those two populations will become so separate that they're no longer capable of surviving and reproducing if they had to, okay? Last one. Polyploidy, okay, so this all has to do with chromosome numbers. So instead of having, so haploid and diploid, important things to know. So haploid means half the number of, of um, chromosomes and diploid would mean double, right? So with haploid, like our haploid number would be 23. So sperm and egg cells all have 23 chromosomes in them. Whereas uh, obviously the rest of our cells, all of our body cells, our somatic cells have 46, right? Which would be double that. What can happen here is during um, during meiosis, we can actually have some unseparated chromosomes or something can go wrong. And we can actually have like a triploid or a tetraploid offspring where there's some sort of self-fertilization and the chromosomes aren't separating and we have double the amount of DNA than we should, okay? So it's basically be like two of our body cells combining together as opposed to like an egg and a sperm cell coming together. And that can cause um, that can cause problems. Like if it happened in humans, we would just die. Um, but what this happens in kind of frequently is actually plants um, and they can survive just fine because they can self-fertilize, right? So they can, they can actually exist with a weird number of chromosomes. But basically what happens is um, they are self-fertilizing then because they're incapable. If you're tetraploid, you then can't mate with something that is diploid, right? So if all of the parent plant species are diploid and this offspring that's produced by an accident is tetraploid, it would be incapable of reducing of reproducing immediately with any of the parental gener uh, generations and therefore it would have formed its own species, okay? Thankfully, plants can self-fertilize and so this, this species could actually propagate um, and grow and develop more plants um, just by that. And then they could obviously sexually reproduce once there was more than one of them. Okay. So that's a funky one. Uh, it is an important one though, really, really important. And it, it has to do with why we have so many different species of plants. All right. Another big vocab word. So, so far we're basically just covering a lot, a lot of vocab tonight, um, and examples with so, so far we have talked about pre and post zygotic barriers, right? One happening before fertilization and one happening after fertilization, but both are reproductive barriers that are preventing different species from mating. We've talked about allopatric and sympatric speciation, right? So with that, we're talking about how um, species can arise either due to geographical barrier and being geographically isolated from one another, which is going to make it easier to stop gene flow, making allopatric speciation actually more common, versus sympatric speciation. Through a couple different mechanisms, we can decrease gene flow there, but it's going to be more difficult because mating between 
um, organisms before speciation has completed is just going to be way more common because they're in the same area. Okay. And lastly, another big keyword that has to do with macroevolution is going to be adaptive radiation. Okay. So radiation, think radiate to spread, right? Like if you have radiation coming off of something, basically shooting off some sort of ray at you. Um, but to radiate, like the sun radiates, uh, we have a lot of different things coming out of one central point. Okay. So adaptive radiation is having a lot of different things come off of one central species due to adaptations that uh, usually have to do with some sort of environment. So I brought back the good old Galapagos finches because why not? That's a great example of different speciation from a common ancestor. Um, and you can see basically all of these things have just, all of these different species have sprung up from a common ancestor based on different environments. Um, and so the same could be true with the lizard example that I showed you, or if you look through that HHMI example, they'll tell you a little bit more about adaptive radiation. Okay, but anytime you see many different species coming out of a parental species, usually because of a um, diverse change in habitat, that's going to be an example of adaptive radiation. All right. Another big topic that I wanted to talk about tonight that I mentioned at the very, very beginning of our podcast is um, phylogenetic trees. Okay, so wow, we've talked about all these different ways that we can get new species, how we prevent species that are separate from mating, um, and that adaptive radiation business where we get lots of different species just from one common ancestor. Um, but the way that we can actually visualize this, which is really, really important, and it shows up on the AP exam all the time, was one of part of the first questions, so one of the long free responses on last year's AP exam. I believe it was also on the 2014 AP exam. So maybe you guys will be safe and free of phylogenetic trees or cladograms. Those are synonyms, okay? Um, because it was just last year, but maybe not, no guarantees. So we'll take a look at this really quickly, um, just because I want you to see what these things are all about. So as I mentioned in the very beginning, super, super important to realize that what this is showing is um, how basically how recently these two species came from a common ancestor. Okay, so if you look all the way to the left of the page, you see something called amniotes. Okay, and we have a rooster or some sort of chicken and a mouse, and they have the most recent connecting branch to one another. Okay, so if you look at where they intersect, that intersection point, it is all the way, it's the top, it's the closest intersection point to the top of the paper, right? That means that they have, if this is like a continuum of time, that means that they have the most recent common ancestor, so they are most closely related to one another, okay? If you look over to where it says teleosis, however the heck you say that, and you see those two fish that also look pretty closely related based on their arch. They are, they definitely have a most recent common ancestor as well. You can see where the arrow is pointing to WGD, okay? Definitely also have a more, a more common, recent common ancestor, right? But their intersection point is just a little bit further back in time than that of the amniotes. And I can tell that because it's further down the page, okay? Sometimes these will be oriented so that it's like left to right instead of top to bottom like it is now. Um, but just know that however close your intersection point is to the edge, that's going to show how recently that common ancestor was and how commonly those species interact. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to show you an example problem because these show up all the time and I want to make sure you're prepared for that. Okay, so this is an actual AP question. So we're gonna take a gander at this, but it says using the following data, use the following data table to construct a cladogram or phylogenetic tree, right? First thing you wanna look at anytime you see data points is the title, right? I know, earth shattering, okay? But the title here says the number of amino acid differences in cytochrome C amongst five species. Okay, so if we're looking for how commonly related species are, uh, we're gonna look at a lot of different things. We can look at something called morpho morphology or morphological data, that's how something looks, or we can look at uh, amino acid or DNA data, um, which is obviously going to be something that requires testing. Yes, the closer to zero, the more commonly related, so perfect, good catch. Um, 
And so, so anytime that we can use amino acids or DNA data uh, is going to be better, right? Because it's just more accurate than just looking at how something looks, right? Because those can be deceiving. Um, and that can also be caused by like convergent evolution or something like that, right? So as Sue pointed out, there's a bunch of zeros running through this table. That should make sense. So sometimes students get confused when they see this table um, because you have to look at kind of simultaneously the rows and the columns. Right, and what I mean by that, I can show you an example. If you look at D polylepis, okay, if you look down the column for D polylepis, you'll notice that all you see is 21 and zero, right? So that means D polylepis and E ferris, if you look to the left where that 21 is, okay, E poly, D polylepis and E ferris have 21 differences between them. That's a lot of differences, okay? Next is zero. The zeros exist because it's between D polylepis and D polylepis. It's the same species. They should have zero differences, right? And then you might be deceived to think, oh, okay, well, that's it for D. polylepis. But that's not the case, right? The rest of the data is just hidden in the D. polylepis row instead of the column, okay? So if you look at the D. polylepis row and you follow it over to the right, you'll see that D. polylepis has 18 amino acid differences with G. gallus, 17 differences with A. forsteri, and 20 differences with E. africanus. Okay, so you just kind of have to look in two places at once to get a coherent look at the data. Okay, here's my rule of thumb though. This is a real easy trick for these. So one, you're looking at the title and you notice that these are amino acid differences. Sometimes they will make these charts based on similarities and you would get the opposite results, right? Because you want lots of similarities in order to show closely, closely relatedness. Okay, but in this case, we're looking at differences. So the smaller the number, the more closely related. Okay, hence the zeros. So what I always tell my students to do is to look for the highest and the lowest number on the table, besides zero, obviously, because those are the same species. So right off the bat, you should be able to point to 21 and one. Okay, so 21, that is the most differences on the table. Okay, and that's between, as we already talked about, D. polylepis and E. ferris. So those two species are the least commonly related of any in the tables. Those two are the least commonly related because they have the highest number of amino acid differences amongst them. Okay, on the flip side, E. africanus and E. ferris, if you look all the way in the upper right hand corner where you see that one, they only have one amino acid difference. They're incredibly similar species. They probably had a most recent common ancestor. And that probably should also make sense because they both have most likely the same um, genus name, right? They both have E dot. So they have the same genus name. They just have different species names. So they're most likely very closely related. Okay. So right off the bat, I know E. africanus and E. ferris need to be really close together on my phylogenetic tree and D. polylepis and E. ferris need to be really far apart on my phylogenetic tree. And that is a really, really good place to start from. Um, and we can actually fill our tree that way. Actually, we can fill in this entire phylogenetic tree pretty much with just the information that you just uh, looked at with our biggest differences and then our best, our most similar organisms, okay? So something that I'm going to try to explain really, really briefly is that with a cladogram or a phylogenetic tree, anytime you see a V point, okay, we can rotate around that axis and it will not change the meaning of the cladogram. Okay, so let me give you an example. All the way on the right of that cladogram that you see at the bottom of this table, there's a V, okay, a little V up in the upper right. So eventually we're gonna put E africanus and E ferris there because they're the most closely related. Okay, but it does not matter if I put E. africanus on the left or the right of that V, okay? So you have a ton of freedom when you're making these cladograms. It's actually really, really awesome um, because you can rotate around that V and it won't change the meaning of your cladogram. So again, I could put E. africanus on the left or on the right and it would mean the same thing as long as it's on the same V or the same branch. We call that a sister taxon as E. ferris, okay? So knowing that, we can put both of those all the way on the right, and we can put D. polylepis all the way on the left, because you should see a trend. Not only is D. polylepis the least closely related to E. ferris, but it also has the highest number of differences with G. gallus, A. forsteri, and E. africanus, if you look at the D. polylepis row. 
Okay, so that guy's gonna belong in the outlier group all the way to the left. It is the least like the others, okay? Then lastly, in that middle V, I'm gonna put my other two species, and that makes sense not only because they're the last two left, but if you look at A. forsteri and G. gallus, they only have three amino acids different from one another, okay? So they're a good fit for my other sister taxon or my other little mini V up there in the middle, okay? Um, so, Sue, it really, really depends as far as your question goes with starting from the closest or the furthest. Um, if you're going to use the method that I just said, where you're looking for least and most commonly related, then it is easy to do it that way. Um, but what I can tell you is that you can actually have, and this is not to overly confuse you, so you can stop listening if it will, but you'll also notice that there's a bigger V on the right of the screen that has both sister taxons attached to it. I wish I could highlight it for you, but unfortunately with this program, I don't believe that I can, okay? But maybe I can if I, can you guys see this arrow? Could you see that arrow? Okay, perfect. This V, this guy right here, okay? So this bigger V can also be rotated around this point and it won't change the meaning of this cladogram. So what that means is I actually could have put E. africanus and E. ferris on this sister taxon and A. forsteri and G. gallus on this sister taxon and it still would be the same cladogram because we have free rotation amongst uh, uh, amongst this point, which is a uh, most recent common ancestor, okay? So it gives you a lot of flexibility there. The most important thing just is that you have E. ferris and E. africanus together. G. gallus and A. forsteri together, and that D. polylepis is all on its own, okay? So you definitely wanna pick your outlier first, um, that's a good rule of thumb, and then you just wanna pair other mo more closely related species together and kind of work your way in like that, okay? All right, so I have that all written out um, on the next slide so that you can see what that looks like. Okay, and if you skipped ahead, then you got the answer early. Um, but my fun fact for you for this evening, and you can share this with your friends, is that G. gallus actually is the, the full name with the whole um, genus as well as species is just gallus gallus, right? So gallus gallus sounds funny, but it's even funnier because it's the scientific name for chicken. So you can like tell your friends, tell your parents, be like, let's enjoy some gallus gallus tonight. And then they'll think you're, you're a bio nerd, which is totally okay. We need more of that, those people in the world. Okay, so Gallus Gallus, your word of the night. All right, I have a couple of thought questions left and we're, we're gonna run out of time shortly here. Um, but I just want you to think about some of these things and if, if we run out of time, you can certainly look through them on your own, okay? Um, but just some like overall kind of things. Now that we've talked about phylogenetic trees, allopatric, sympatric speciation, um, pre and post zygotic barriers, Right, it's, it's kind of important to see what that looks like or how you can apply it. Um, so one thought question would be to consider two species that diverged while geographically separated, okay? So they're starting out basically in, in the, the starts of perhaps um, habitat isolation or, or allopatric speciation, but they resumed contact, so they resumed contact before reproductive isolation was complete. So this is kind of what I was talking about. They're going in different directions and, and kind of adapting to their own environments, um, but then they come back together before they're completely reproductively isolated. So they can make babies, okay? Then you can kind of think about what would happen if A, the hybrid offspring survived and reproduced more poorly than the individual species offspring, or B, if the hybrid offspring survived and reproduced as well as offspring from the individual species offspring, okay? And this goes into that idea of, of uh, a couple different things. One would be reproductive isolation, but the other would be um, preventing that gene flow um, and some post-zygotic barriers are gonna be talked about here. So in situation A, if the hybrid offspring survived and reproduced more poorly, right, then, then that's more of like a hybrid viability situation or a hybrid fertility situation. That's essentially a post-zygotic barrier. So even though these species can still mate because um, they've, they've found each other before, speciation has technically ended, um, they, their offspring are not going to survive very well, and therefore those are probably going to just die off, and we'll probably see that speciation complete, uh, even though their reproductive isolation was not complete. Okay, In B, 
uh, if their offspring are surviving just as well as when the individual species are mating, then we are just going to create one giant species again. So speciation will not complete um, just because their gene pools are going to mix and any adaptations that they each individually evolved uh, are going to become each other's adaptations because friendship is sharing and sharing is caring. Okay. All right. We'll do one more question um, for the night and then wrap it up. Um, but this is a question from an old AP exam. So kind of nice to see what this might look like in multiple choice. Um, so the appearance of a fertile polyploid individual within a population of diploid organisms, fertile polyploid, remember polyploid means they have more than uh, the right number of chromosomes, within a population of diploid organisms is a possible source of a new species, that's what we were talking about. If this individual is capable of reproducing to form a new population, scientists would consider this to be an example of, you guys should know this because we talked about it as a great way to prevent gene flow in... B, sympatric speciation, okay? So that's an example of how they might apply um, some sort of sympatric speciation question for you. 